Okay, good morning students and welcome to the fifth lecture of this course, <coughs> Internet of Things. So, in this lecture, we'll continue our discussion on the communication technologies for IoT. So, <coughs> so far in the previous two lectures, we have been discussing about the infrastructure protocols. As you know that the <coughs> protocols that are used in an IoT ecosystem can be divided into primarily three categories. The ones which we call infrastructure protocols, then comes the service discovery protocol, and finally, the application protocols. So we are currently talking about the infrastructure protocol. So as the name implies, and as we have seen for the last two classes, in the last two classes, that these protocols are primarily used for data transmission through the network infrastructure. That is, it's primarily the protocols that ensure that data can be transferred from the devices to other devices or from the devices to the network components, such as the gateway or the server or to the cloud through the internet. So the protocols that primarily talk about this data transformation is what we refer to as the infrastructure protocols, right? So when it comes to finding out, okay, how the devices would be communicating among themselves or the devices would be communicating to the cloud via the internet, there are a few questions that comes up. And the primary question that comes up is, how are we going to address the devices which are connected to the network? So, identification of the devices through an address is the first concern. And an obvious solution is to go for the already existing addressing scheme, which is the IPv4. And as we all know that IPv4 is a 32-bit addressing scheme. So, that is the normal trend to use that for addressing the different devices. But the problem is that very soon you will run out of addresses because as we know that millions and millions of devices are getting connected each day and to accommodate all of them using an IPv4 addressing scheme that is using 32 bit is very difficult. So the obvious choice would be to switch to a different addressing scheme which would allow larger number of bits for addressing. And that is the reason why the IPv6 protocol is the one that is primarily used for the IoT devices. Now, IoT uh, IPv6 protocol, it utilizes 128-bit addressing. So automatically, the number of addresses that can be generated is 3.4 into 10 to the power 38, which is sufficiently large to accommodate a large number of IoT devices that are increasing day by day. So this is the pictorial representation of the IPv6 address, where you see that the 128 bit is divided into groups of 16 bits. The first four groups of 16 bits, that is, sorry, the three groups of 16 bits, the 48 bits, they form the network part. The next 16 forms the subnet, and finally, the client ID. So this is the addressing scheme that has to be followed if we want to accommodate the growing IoT devices in the network. But the problem is that whenever we apply IPv6 addressing, the datagram, the packets of IPv6, they are big and the moment you have a large data packet, transfer of this data packet from one device to another or from one device to some other network, it's not only it's time consuming and more importantly, it utilizes or uses uh, or it requires high power. And this is a constraint for IoT devices. So as we know that it is good large address space, but there are a few challenges while using these um, 
IPv6 packets. And the primary problem that we have is, as we've already discussed, is how to ensure that these IPv6 packets can be made to communicate or is made to communicate between devices which are constrained devices, right? So this is one of the biggest challenge. And we saw that there are different, uh, one way to handle this problem is to ensure or to come up with a very um, robust topology. And there have been topologies which have been proposed. But our focus would primarily be towards the different network technologies. And the technology that we are actually looking at is something called six low pan. So the idea is how can we apply these IPv6 packets in a low power wireless personal area network? Because majority of this technique or the network technology that is used to communicate between devices is a low power technology. So how can we apply that? How can we apply this IPv6 packets? on this low power technology, which basically uses IEEE 802.15.4 standard. So this is the biggest challenge. And this is a challenge because as I've already told that the devices that use this IEEE 802.15.4 standard, which form this wireless personal area network are resource constant devices. They are low power devices, which are mainly battery operated. So you cannot have a very uh, you know, you cannot handle IPv6 packets for long because it will drain out the battery. So what to do? Well, so the idea is to come up with a specific, uh, you know, networking technique. And that is what led to the you know introduction of 6 low pan. So here you see the, the 6 low pan stack, which is compared with the usual OSI model. And as in case of the simplified OSI model, which is shown to be of five layers instead of seven layers here, the equivalent six low pan stack is also of, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, six layers in this case, where data link layer is divided into two layers. So in case of the OSI model, we use the physical layer, which primarily is about how to transfer the data. That is, how do you send the bits? What kind of a communication medium you are going to use? What should be the data rate? How to handle noise, etc. is handled in the physical layer. In case of a six low pan, the data transmission, as you see here, is handled through the IEEE 802.15.4 standard. That takes care of the data transmission. Sitting on top of that is the data link layer, which primary goal is to handle the data transmission, it look, it takes care of the, um, the media access control as well as the error free communication. And same thing happens in this case as well. In case of six low pan stack, the IEEE 802.15.4, this standard itself ensures the media access control. How do you communicate? How do you ensure that the data bits or the packets they receive or is, um, yeah, is received at the network devices. But something which is interesting and which is part of the data link layer for a six low pan stack is this layer, which is the adaptation layer. And this is the one that makes six low pan suitable for low power devices. What do you have in this? So the adaptation that has to be done is for <clears throat> the IP6, IPv6 packets, which are coming from these layers so that they can be sent or received via this standard. And the adaptation that is done is, first of all, the headers have to be compacted or they have to be you know, optimized. So the headers which include both the IPv6 packets as well as the UDP packets, so all they have to be compressed. So the first thing that is done is header compression which reduces the size of the packet because uh, the entire data packet of an IoT, uh, IPv6 cannot be handled in IEEE 802.15.4, which is the lower layer uh, protocol. 
The next thing that is done is fragmentation, where again, the data packets are split up into number of frames. Each frame is given a certain number and then they are transmitted. So instead of sending a big packet, you split up that into smaller chunks called frames, assign a number, and then they are sent. Well, during when these packets are sent, it's not necessary that names packets are sent is ordered, and that is the reason why you need to associate some number with each frame so that it can contain the information about the frame, which is used at the destination node and where all these frames will be reassembled. So we call that reassembly. So you fragment, send them, maybe out of order and at the destination node, or maybe during the hop, you keep on reassembling that as it as the packets proceed. So this is basically the two adaptation techniques that are done in six loop app, and that's done in the data link layer. Okay, so that is what is the additional thing that is done to ensure that IPv6 packets can flow the IEEE 254.4 standard. So the of that is the network layer whose primary goal is to ensure data packets reach from the source to destination. Uh, there, there are a number of network layers protocols which are there for the OSI model. For 6 lopan we primarily focus on the IPv6. We already have discussed that. It's the IPv6 packets that have to be transferred. And there's a special you know, requirement of a specific topology. We already have discussed about this routing protocol, which follows a, a tree type of a structure where it's a directed destination oriented, directed acyclic graph where you have your uh, different nodes, they send the data packets to one destination. But for that, the tree has to be built, and there's a procedure for building the tree uh, through use of certain control messages. The, the route, which is the one, the router, which actually communicates to the external environment or to the internet, is the one that sends out messages, and that message is propagated through different path. And along the path, if a particular router gets that message, it decides whether I will be at the route, the, the layer or the node on top of that is to be considered its parent. If it allows, if it uh, chooses a particular node as a parent, then automatically the tree is built to a certain level and this process goes on until all the net nodes have their parent information. And then they send out the packets from the node to the parent and in this way, it goes up, up to the root node. So this is the kind of routing procedure that is followed in 6 lopan using a specific networking topology. Then comes the transport layer, which ensures that how the devices would be connected, how the connection would be established. TCP, as you see, is the most widely used network, which um, is basically a connection-oriented network, where for every device, there will be a channel which is created, and the devices would communicate using their own channel. But this, is, this incurs a lot of overhead. So usually for 6 lopan we follow UDP, which is kind of a broadcast mechanism where you don't care about uh, the destination address and you keep on broadcasting. So this is preferable in case of 6 lopan stack. And finally, the application layer protocols that ensures data formatting. And as you see here, there are quite a few of uh, application layer protocols which are used while you prefer a 6 lopan stack. HTTP is the one that is uh, used primarily for uh, computer networks. So people initially started thinking, can we use HTTP? But then HTTP is based on TCP and HTTP mainly uses um, something called, called an XML type of data formatting, which is a text-based you know, uh, way of writing the data. And uh, that incurs a huge overhead because the text-based Kind of protocol, so it, it uh, mechanism, so it incurs huge overhead. So uh, later on, HTTP was modified, and uh, the different protocols that came in the picture was OAP, MQTT. So these are the commonly used application layer protocols for a six loop and stack. We'll be focusing on these two in the next lecture.
Okay, so this is the first thing that has to be understood that we came up with a stack that ensures IPv6 packets can be uh, can move through one device to the other or from one IoT device, a low power IoT device to the internet. The architecture is like this that you have a um, six low band network, which in turn gets connected to the edge routers. This is the one that actually connects your six low band network to the internet. So this is basically the first step towards applying a proper networking technology for IoT devices. Then there are a few other technologies which are also available. Uh, low power one, <clears throat> um, one of the most commonly used protocol for communication among devices which are resource constrained is the Bluetooth protocol. And it's again a short range personal area network. You can use devices which are going to communicate within a very short range. The devices can be low power devices. They themselves, they create a small network, personal network. So one device will be able to recognize another device. And if the two devices recognize each other, they can start sending and receiving data. So the Bluetooth has its own stack, very important. We'll talk about that. And uh, so instead of you following the OSI model, it has its own stack, very similar to how we saw six low pan has its own stack. Bluetooth also has that. Bluetooth works at 2.4 gigahertz band and it uses frequency hopping something. So you can move from one frequency to the other. The data rate is 3 Mbps and maximum range is 100 meters. So this is basically the Bluetooth protocol. And as you see here, the Bluetooth architecture, um, just compare with the OSI model. And you see here, this is the physical layer that is actually responsible for transmission of bits. Okay. So the transmission will be through a wired medium or wireless medium. Basically, it's it's a wireless medium, right? So you need a radio frequency for transmission. And what will be the frequency of transmission using this wireless will be handled in this physical layer. Okay, so how what kind of a frequency will you allow for transmission of this electromagnetic waves? Now, sitting on top of that is the link layer, which consists of two um, sub layers. The first one is called LMP, which stands for Link Manager Protocol. And this Link Manager Protocol is the layer that establishes the link between the Bluetooth devices. So we know that Bluetooth works by creating a network of uh, devices. So one device has to recognize the other, and there is a technique called pairing, which is involved. Pairing is nothing but identifying another Bluetooth device requesting the other Bluetooth device to start communication, establishing a link, and then the uh, data transfer starts. So this is the process. Uh, you scan for Bluetooth device, you find out whether there's a Bluetooth device within a certain range. Once it is decided, you send out a request, and the request is sent out in the form of a passphrase or a key, which is shared among both the devices. That's called pairing. Once it has been paired with a particular device, you maintain the information about the paired device, and then you start transferring the data. So this layer is the one that establishes this link between the Bluetooth devices. It also um, ensures authentication and encryption because it has to be through a passphrase, right? So there is some kind of encryption and authentication that is required. Uh, so this is handled here, the little link layer. And then comes a uh, interface, which is called the host controller interface. And this interface is the one that allows these layers to make use of the lower layers. This is called HCI. So the host controller interface is the one that establishes or allows the upper layers, the application and the middleware to um, have an access of the data link and the physical layer. And um, the second module, the second layer of the data link layer is the logical link uh, adaptation layer, which actually allows the upper frame, upper layer frame to the lower layer frames, right? And they have their own uh, mechanism. They have their own uh, frame format. So the upper layer frames coming from the application uh, has uh, made ready 
so that they can be used by the lower layers, that is the data link and the physical layer, and then that frame can be transferred. So this, you know, conversion of the upper layer frame so that it can be understood by the lower layer frames is done here. This is the adaptation. And sitting on top of that is some kind of a command set. You all know that it, this is the, these are the 80 commands that are used in Bluetooth for establishing the handshaking for the communication. Uh, quite a few other kind of, uh, you know, um, service discovery. Then we have the protocols which are adapted from standard models like TCP, etc. And finally, the application layer, which is uh, the layer that allows you to interact with the Bluetooth application. So this is overall the idea of Bluetooth. But Bluetooth was improved and uh, People came up with the Bluetooth low energy, which is in short called BLE. And the idea was to improve the range, first of all, from about 10 meters to 100 meters, to reduce the latency 15 times almost, and to have a lower operating power of the order of 0 0.01 milliwatt. So that, that's, this is the prime requirement. So as you see here, uh, this also has its own stack and sitting on sitting at the bottom is the physical layer which is handling the uh, transmission of the bits okay so this is responsible for reception and transmission then we have the uh, sitting sitting on top of that is the link layer again which is if you compare that with the osi model it's the data link layer whose responsibility is to handle the media access control that is it ensures that the bits actually receive a network device. It handles the error control, the flow control. Okay. Um, then we have the host controller interface. I've already discussed that this is the one that allows the link layer to access the data from the upper layers. Okay. Because uh, the data will move from the application to through these middleware layers into the link layer. So the interface that allows this to happen is host control interface. Then we have uh, the logical link control. Again, it's the same thing, very similar to you saw in the actual Bluetooth uh, format. And here we have an adaptation, adaptation of those frames which come, come from the upper layer and will be applied in the lower layers. So the frame formatting has to be done. And then there are uh, two important things. One is called the generic access protocol and which defines the processes related to the discovery of Bluetooth devices. Okay. So, uh, we saw here that there's a, um, the Bluetooth has to be, the device has to be discovered. Okay. So, one is you maintain an attribute of that and the other is you maintain a profile of the particular Bluetooth device. So there are two things which are important. Okay. So there are a few protocols which are defined, which are called attribute protocols. And uh, so a profile of all these is maintained here of the Bluetooth device. And this is the functions that provide you the access to them. So think that in terms of some kind of services, some rules that have been decided, and you maintain a profile of that, that this particular Bluetooth device will use these, 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 these rules. And the way to apply those rules is through some uh, functions or some methods. And that is what is there in the general access profile. So you have here, it's a framework, you know, which defines what are the services that you will be using, what are their characteristics. So that is what is used in the, uh, the generic attribute profile. And the access profile will be how you are going to use that. Will you be using that as a broadcaster? Because you may have someone who initiates the Bluetooth transmission and there is a broadcaster who's going to send the data. The, on the other side, there may be a Bluetooth device that is only receiving the data. So it may be an observer. So the access protocol will tell you what role you're going to play, the Bluetooth device is going to play, whether it will be a broadcaster, an observer, or simply just collecting data. And the attribute will, tell what are the kind of services that will be used. So the, overall, this is the improvement 
um, on the Bluetooth standard, which is specifically for low energy and heavily used today in different IoT devices. Or, as you all know, that it's it's primarily for communication among devices and between devices and the internet. Then we also have a, a third kind of a low power uh, technology, which is used for near communication, which is the RFID, the radio frequency identification, uh, where the idea is to use a tag, it, there's a microchip, and the microchip is programmed with a tag. Tag is nothing but an information, which the information which is provided by the company or by the, um, the service provider. So this tag that we have is a unique identifier, and that is used for tracking objects. So this technology is primarily used for uh, identifying and tracking objects. So you have a chip, you have the chip being programmed with a particular number, some information, some data, and this is transferred via some antenna to a reader. So the company that devised this is EPC Global, and they are the ones who provide the standards for this. So one key reasons why RD has been popular is because it's open. You can use it. There's no restriction about usage. You can use as many devices as possible RFID tags, so there's no problem. And uh, it's reliable. So sp specifically due to these three reasons, RFID is has become popular and it's heavily used in logistic industry, even for tracking uh, animals. For department is using that. So for object tracking, this is one of the most popularly used uh, technology. Uh, talking about the component, there are two components. One is the signal transponder, and the second one is the receiver, which we call the tag reader. The RFID tag, as you know, is a chip. So as you see here, this is the uh, operation mechanism. So you have uh, initially the reader, it sends out and beacon kind of a thing, some kind of a signal for us to find out, well, is there any tag which is within my range? So if a particular tag is within the range of that, the tag information is collected and that is sent to the host, which is a computer, and the computer will be maintaining a database and the database, it will look up to the database and will identify that particular look up to the information collected from the tag. And uh, if that tag information is matched, and if it is able to know, it may uh, request for some additional information and accordingly send out some notifications or do some analytics on that. So idea is this, that you collect some radio waves from the tag, which sends out a number or some information the reader collects it out to the some information set a computer which is attached to that and there is where to maintain a database and do some analytics so the information that is sent out is called the epc code and this epc code is of two types a 64 bit code and a 96 bit The first field is which is of eight bits, and the field is the, gives you the version number. Okay, say uh, below you find is an example that shows you a possible um, an example of an EPC code where the digits are written in hexadecimal, and this is the uh, information about the EPC format that is used, the header information. Then comes the the manager field which is again a unique number, which is assigned by the EPC global to the company who's going to use it for. So let's say I am having a, a, a retail shop where I have a lot of items and I want to associate a tag to each of the item. So I have to approach EPC global, they will be giving me a particular number and accordingly I will be fixing up that number. That number will again have two parts, one to decide on that particular company because 
specifically to that particular so retail shop. And second is identifying each objects. So here you see that's a unique number uh, that you are going to use for the product manufacturer. And then we have the next uh, bits which will be used for the object class. They will be uh, representing the product number. And so it's a unique number which will be specified for a particular product. And uh, then we have the serial number, which is a unique number assigned by the manufacturer to every individual product. So overall, this are the different fields that are used in creating an EPC code. This is again a very near um, range communication. So we discussed about um, six low pan, then we discussed about the Bluetooth low energy, and then we have a low range communication, which is EPC. Okay. Another one that is uh, used today is called the long term evaluation evolution, sorry, or advanced LTE. It's a mobile standard, or sh should I say a wireless mobile standard, which is used in uh, the wireless mobiles. So it's a standard which is used by uh, wireless mobiles. You may have seen this particular um, icon blinking on your mobile phones, which writes 4G LTE. 4G is the spectrum and LTE is the, uh, the standard that is used. So what it actually does is it provides a high speed data transfer rate. Okay. So if you are going to use uh, instead of six low pan or Bluetooth energy or RPC, uh, EPC, if you are planning to use mobile for communication, then you may have to rely on the mobile technologies. And we are going to talk about that in just a moment. Uh, we'll talk about the different mobile technologies. So uh, coming to the mobile technologies, which uses wireless mobile network, if you want to use high speed data transfer rate, then you have to rely on the LTE standard. So what LTE does is it's a broadcast mechanism. It sends out the data uh, and uh, it uses a single frequency network. Okay, so there's no frequency hopping here. So it's, if it starts sending, it sends only at one particular frequency. So even today we see a lot of IoT devices, they prefer 4G LTE standard for communication, provided you, you allow uh, mobile network. So you may may have your device may have your uh, GSM standard. You may allow SIM card to be inserted into the IoT device. Some devices do have that. So maybe you can make use of mobile networks for communication. Then comes something called the Z wave, and it's heavily used in home automation system. So this is again a low power wireless communication protocol, which is as you see here, it's used in home area network and uh, it is primarily used for remote control applications. So uh, for a very small kind of a commercial domain, if you would like to have connectivity between devices and uh, another device, you use this particular protocol. So Z-Wave is a very, uh, you know, very popular protocol which is used and it was divide, uh, developed by Zensis and uh, as you see here, it's again, uh, it works at 900 megahertz. So quite about amount of data, data rate. And so the architecture is, as you see here, so we have uh, something called a controller, which is called the Z-Wave controller. And this Z-Wave controller is the one that is, uh, that has the capacity to build the routing tables. Okay, so we, Instead of using uh, big routers and all, you use a controller. Routers are also controllers, but here we have this controller specifically configured for these kind of devices. So it builds the routing table. So let's say one device would like to interact with another device. It has to go through this way, right? So through the controller, it comes to another device. And uh, there are two kind of controllers. We have a primary controller which is actually, uh, you know, that maintains the network. So this is the one that has any information about the entire network, all the devices, their IDs, uh, their routing path, etc., is maintained in this controller. 
and to have a backup of that you can have another controller which is the uh, secondary controller and uh, it may uh, normally it's not used until you require it to have some kind of you know, load balancing or something and so this is about it and these are called nodes so these are the nodes that uh, communicate via the controller okay so as you see mobile can also be node which makes use of the zw controller to connect to the internet or it can be other iot devices and then we finally have uh, the popular wi-fi connectivity mechanism we are all aware of that we have been using that it's a wireless local area network and we all have been using this on our laptop and uh, mobile phones etc so in some cases wi-fi is also used for communicating or for communication uh, for allowing an iot device to communicate to the network so you can make use of wi-fi we know that raspberry pi for example is an uh, iot device that has an onboard wi-fi hardware so you can make use of wi-fi to send or receive data from any uh, iot device that is uh, maybe that uses raspberry pi to send out to the Wi-Fi is also one of the technologies that is used. I'm not going into the details because it's already known and had been used. There are different standards. We can use any one of them depending on the requirement. So to summarize, we came across four to five different technologies. We started off with six low pan that uses the IEEE 802.15.4 standard. Uh, then we came up with the Bluetooth low energy, which is based on the Bluetooth standard and has its own way of handling the data. Then we discussed about uh, the uh, the Z wave, the uh, the Wi-Fi. Okay, so all these technologies, as you see, are primarily for handling IoT devices, data between a uh, data transfer between IoT devices to another IoT device, or one IoT device to the uh, routers. Or IoT device to the internet, how we manage to handle these, you know, IPv6 packets through these low power devices. So we have to communicate, yet we cannot allow, uh, you know, a standard uh, high power network. So this is the idea behind developing so many technologies. Now, with this, we end our discussion about the infrastructure protocols. I would um, ask you to go through that in more details in the textbooks referred. And now we switch our uh, discussion towards. So once uh, discussion towards um, the discovery of the devices. OK, so now that we understood, OK, well, this these are the technologies that we are going to use. The next concern is how will a device be identified in a network? So if you are using a lot of devices and you're using a network, how will you be able to communicate to a particular device? How will you be identified? The standard way of identifying a computer when a computer gets connected to a network is through an address that is assigned. We call it the IP address, right? But we all know that there is something more involved in that. And we normally don't uh, communicate at the application layer when you write programs or you uh, write applications for uh, communication you don't mention ip addresses rather what we mention is names right i hope all of you know that so what you actually do is you have some names and these names are converted into their IP addresses. Okay, so every computer that you uh, I want to communicate to, instead of actually referring to its IP address, your application mentions some name, okay? And that name gets resolved. That means that name has to be converted into its corresponding address. And that's not an easy step. Because the name resolution, suppose I write 
www.xyz.com. Well, this name has to be resolved to a certain IP address. Let's say 172.20.5.16. That's okay. That has to be resolved. But in between, this passes through a number. The network takes a number of uh, different, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, nodes are involved in the entire path up to this particular computer. So all have to be resolved. So how do you do this? So there's a different procedure for doing that. We call it the name resolution. We have a specific way of identifying the names in the network and accordingly we travel the path. It's again a tree structure and you try to identify, well, uh, this is a company Then there's a particular uh, organization and it will be following the internet. So depending on the different, you know, um, parts of that name, you try to go on identifying which is the uh, address that should be resolved and accordingly you reach the final computer. This is the name resolution that is involved and we know that all this is this happens this is also a service where the name will be resolved so that happens in a name server now what happens in case of iot devices how will this be taken care of so this is what we are going to talk about so one of the basic requirements of an iot is resource management okay there are a lot a lot of devices which are connected how do you manage those resources? How are you going to manage them? The first and the foremost thing that should be kept in mind is that whatever resource you are going to use has to be identified. And for that, you must know the device. So there should be some kind of a registration involved in that. Somewhere, you're going to maintain a registry. Very similar to how we take admission in our uh, university so the moment you take admission that your name is registered so that i will be able to identify you who are you when did you come etc etc so your you know details will be recorded so similarly every device that gets connected to a network has to register itself right and that registry will be maintained somewhere so that somebody can discover the resources that well, this particular device is residing where? To which network is it connected? Okay. <clears throat> and this registration, discovery, it should be self configured because the devices are, you know, low powered, low constraint. So you cannot um, have a very, you know, uh, bulky any name service running on top of that. It's not feasible. So they should be able to do that self. That should be dynamic. You may be able to change because I may move from one network to the other. So I may have to change my policy. And <clears throat> the different, based on these two requirements, there are quite a few uh, service discovery procedures or technologies that have been uh, identified, which are suitable for an IoT ecosystem. And we are going to talk about one by one these. So is that clear? The logic behind this? The logic is that devices have to register themselves. And if devices uh, require some services, the services will also be registered. So you need to have that, well, this is the IoT device and it is providing this service. Okay. How are you going to identify that device? And how are you going to make use of the services provided by them? So the most efficient technology, the service discovery technology, that is, or the popular, the most popular one is a Bluetooth beacon. What is it? You make use of Bluetooth devices and one device, which is, uh, you make use of the Bluetooth protocol. So if a particular device, wants to identify itself or it wants to say uh, make itself identifiable it sends out beacons okay beacons as you know it's kind of a uh, some kind of electromagnetic wave that you send out whether sound or light or whatever so it is going to send out some beacons 
and these beacons will contain the unique ID of that particular device, right? So the beacon will be having the ID and uh, the, ident the ID will be specific to that particular beacon, the beacon that is coming out of a device. And suppose you are using a Bluetooth device, maybe a mobile. So any user who's having a mobile that allows Bluetooth will be receiving these beacons. Okay. So they will receive the beacon, they will recognize the ID, and accordingly, they will trigger some notification. Simple. Okay. So the device generates beacons, the receiver receives them, identifies the ID, while it is, if it is known, trigger some notifications. This is what is, this is what is saying. This is the most widely used. Next comes Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi aware as it is called. It's nothing but you uh, just update Wi-Fi so that it can allow beacon-like features. So if you have <clears throat> uh, some, you know, uh, devices which are there, so it says, uh, suppose, um, uh, yeah, so if you are going to use Wi-Fi and uh, if you have a number of mobile devices which are all using Wi-Fi, suppose there's a new one who's going to join that network. Okay, so all it does is, well, it starts sending beacons and all of that who are part of the network will be receiving the beacons and will be uh, either identifying the new connected device or will say that okay uh, if you want to join the network send me your details i'll keep out of you allowing a new node to join so all you it's it's just you are allowing some beacons to be part of the wi-fi then comes the physical wave that's again a very interesting uh, technique where you have a device it broadcasts the beacons but this time it contains an url right so the device will contain uh, the beacons will contain the URL and uh, the if there's any mobile phone that wants to know or get receives that it detects the physical web signals so from that entire signal that is received through the beacon it will obtain the physical web what is that well it will try to get those BLE signals the Bluetooth signals from that which contains the information about the device etc it can be through this okay then this is the one that is today very popular which is called chirp so what you do is here uh, you are using chirp as you know is the sound of a bird so what we do is the information that you have plan to send is actually encoded in a sound of a bird so there's a particular frequency associated with the the bird sound and you have a data you encode the text is encoded in the form of uh, melodic tweedles so what what is that it's like the alphabets of electronic bird songs that's why it's called chirp and interestingly it comes from twitter because in some cases if you don't want to send this directly um, to the device doesn't want to directly send this songs you can actually convert it into an URL and so that's, that's the idea of communication or identifying a particular device. Okay, and then we have um, Shazam, which is again a mobile app which was introduced in the early 2000 and it's, uh, it was basically a mobile app be able to identify music if you are able to get a device device microphone and so it was initially for that for identifying music from by uh, from the getting uh, access to the microphone but today it's used for identifying digital content from different real world objects so same principle is used so <clears throat> these are the different <clears throat> uh, technologies that are used for discovery of devices so if you want to find out whether the device is there or not in the network or you want to communicate to a particular device and you want to first identify the device, these are the ways in which you can go ahead. It's either through Bluetooth beacon or through a Wi-Fi aware, physical web, chirp or Shazam. These are the most popularly used <coughs> technologies. Now comes the IoT service discovery. 
So we are done with uh, identifying the device. Now the question is that how we'll have the services, the IoT services, how will that be discovered? Well, uh, one of the ways that we do is through the same principle as in case of the naming service, and we call it the DNS service discovery. DNS stands for domain name service. You all know that this is the service through which the names are resolved. Okay. And we'll actually be focusing on MDNS. Let's see what it is. This is the um, idea behind the, uh, the naming. So what we have here is that we have a unicast. It, it basically MDNS works very similar to unicast DNS server. Let's, let's look at that. Now, suppose uh, I want to know, I have a name called client three, right? But I don't know client three is the name of which of these devices. Or in other words, you may know, you may say, I want to know the address of client three. So what happens is client one, if it wants to know the address of client three, because I would be communicating to that particular device. So it starts sending out this information, asking a question. See, it sends out this question, who is client three? And that is multicast. Not multicast, or, okay, yeah. So it's it's sent out uh, parallel to all of them. Okay, so yeah, so that's, that's the multicast domain name. So uh, once this information is received by all of them, right? The one that actually has this name, that is client three, it sends out the information back to all of this entire network, not only to client one, which requested that, but all of them, because client two also did not have an information about client three. It got this message from client one that, okay, there's a question put out by who is client three, but when, because it is not client three and it does not have an information about client three, when it gets the information from client three, it maintains this information in its cache. So that next time when there is any information or a request coming from client three, it can directly communicate. So it already knows. This is the idea behind multicast domain name. So one of them initiates the process. The one with actually has the name response and responds to the entire network. So the rest of the nodes, they get that response and maintain it in the cache. So this is the way in which the services are discovered. See, this is not only I'm mentioning about the name, but that can be for any service. Suppose you want to know, well, who has this particular service? There are a lot of devices connected in the network. I want to know who has this particular service. How will you get that information? You put a request, the request is broadcasted or rather multicasted across the network. The person or the device that has that service responds and responds again to multicast with the entire network. And that information is maintained in the registry. So next time when you will be requiring or the device will be requiring the services, it already knows because it looks up to the registry and finds that, well, this is the device that is providing me the services. This is how it works. And uh, as you see, DNS discovery, the name, the naming resolution, basically. Uh, this is the one that was used mainly for printing purpose. So let's say there are a number of uh, printers who are connected, a lot of devices who are connected. You want a particular, you don't know which is going to provide you the service. So here is a client that puts a request that is there any print service? The one that having that has ha, that has the print service responds. So the print service responds by providing the printed domain, and accordingly, the printers are identified. Okay. So here we have a <coughs> pairing of the IP addresses to the host names, <coughs> and it actually uses MDNS. So uh, this is kind of a discovery that helps clients to discover a set of services. A very very important task because we have to use it. 
The second mechanism is universal plug and play, where uh, a device automatically obtains the IP addresses. And uh, as you see, there's already a network which is in place. Another device wants to get connected to the network, but you just cannot start using the devices, other devices, you cannot communicate. You have to make yourself identified in that network. And for that, you need some kind of an addressing. So it obtains the uh, IP address the moment it joins. So there is no configuration required. Okay. There's no configuration required. You connect it, no administration required. So um, this is the way things will be there. And uh, as you see here, so the device will advertise itself. Well, I have, this is me and I want to join that. And uh, this control point will be maintaining the device description, etc. And then once the device has been identified and once the registry is maintained, you start communicating by action and response. This is called universal plug and play. There are quite a few prominent IoT service discovery products which are available in the market. And the most popular is Bonjour, which is the one product of Apple. And it's a service discovery protocol where no configuration is required. And so you have a networking architecture that provides features and it, it provides features for discovery of TCP or IP based service. So if you are planning to give some services, which is making use of a TCP protocol or IP protocol, you can make use of this particular bonjour. So suppose you have a number of devices which are there, which are connected in LAN. One of them, let's say, is allowing you a shared printer or a network printer or cloud printing, whatever. You want to uh, allow that to be used by other devices. So that's a printer service which is provided and the printer service can be made use of or may be provided to other. So you can use this service discovery protocol to maintain a, a registry or information about that particular product uh, service. We have others as well, console all join. So they are for console is primarily for health checking and all, all join is again for uh, uh, for different other purposes. So this is uh, basically all about service discovery protocols.